Hello everyone, um, Jeff Moran here. Uh, welcome back to some further uh, discussion, analysis of Tim O'Brien's The Things They Carried. We're going to be looking at right now what I believe is the fourth chapter titled On the Rainy River. Um, this is a longer chapter than the ones that we have uh, uh, looked at so far really. Um, more of an I guess a, a, a typical narrative technique in this uh, in this chapter. Um, I don't know how much there is to uh, say about this necessarily uh, that he, the author, doesn't say himself. I find this uh, a few things very interesting and very you know, very much worthy of, of note here. Um, I do love the way that this, I, I love everything about this chapter. I think this is a beautifully written chapter. I think it really gives insight into the narrator. I believe it gives insight into his character, to his struggles, um, to him, him weighing out what is right, what is the right thing to do and what is the wrong thing to do. And we see his the way he comes to his decision and the reason he decides to go into the war his his rationale behind that is different than what i think we would believe the rationale to be which i also think is important because it a lot of what he mentions throughout as the narrator a lot of what we civilians people who've never been in war literary types whatever the way the stereotype we have in our mind of a soldier is not at all the way this person perceives himself or perceives war or perceives a soldier or whatever and this is a very good illustration of that. The chapter begins, very interestingly enough, where he says, this is one story I've never told before. And I find this interesting because this is something that he's held close, never really told anyone about this, but here he is exposing that in the written word to anyone who is willing to purchase, pick up, and read his book and this is a very we so we get right away a sense that this is a confessional moment for him that um, uh, he's he's laying something bare opening up unburdening himself as it were we find here too that the narrator and the author are the same person it's it's on that first page of this chapter that he actually names himself Tim O'Brien um, so we know that this is you know we've, we've suspected it but he comes out right here and tells us this is an autobiographical um, piece that he's that he's working on this entire work the focus of this though is when he receives his draft notice okay he's not a soldier he has a job working uh, in a, a, a a slaughterhouse pig slaughterhouse um, it's a stinky job he hates it it's gross it's disgusting um, of course uh, what he's gonna find is that the what's in store for him when he goes to war is far worse than this job that he hates right now and he finds out on June 17th 1968 uh, when he opens a letter and realizes that yes his name has come up on the draft He's not a soldier. He's not somebody who went into the military. This is not something that he is prepared or even desiring to do. This is something that the government is saying, your number has been called, son. You are going to fight for your country in this war that he doesn't know as much about. He thinks uh, to himself and goes through his, goes through his mind um, his reaction to this. Um, I'm reading from the, the same page where he uh, gets his letter. He says, I was too good for this war, too smart, too compassionate, too everything. It couldn't happen. 
I was above it. I had the world dict, Phi Beta Kappa and Summa Cum Laude and president of the student body and a full ride scholarship for grad studies at Harvard. A mistake, maybe. A foul up in the paperwork. I was no soldier. I hated Boy Scouts. I hated camping out. I hated dirt and tents and mosquitoes. The sight of blood made me queasy and I couldn't tolerate authority and I didn't know a rifle from a slingshot. All right. So <clears throat> we find here that he is not equipped to be a soldier. This was never in the cards for him. This is just something, the luck of the draw, the lottery chose him to have to do this. And so what happens is he doesn't know what to do. He's in Minnesota. As you know, the next stop up from Minnesota is Canada, um, where people went. The stories are that they went there to dodge the draft and not have to be recruited against their will um, into this war. Um, and so he toys with the idea because it says in there also that he didn't qualify for CO status. CO stands for conscientious objector. There are people who can say for religious purposes, uh, my, my conscience won't allow me to fight in a war, to kill or to be involved in these things. And the, uh, the government can grant people conscientious objector status, meaning that you know, my conscience will not allow me to participate in this war. He says that he didn't qualify for that. Um, but one of the things he mentions is that he was very worried about how his community would see him, would view him if he did not participate in this and follow it through. He mentions uh, the people sitting around a table down at the old Gobbler Cafe on Main Street and what might they think of him if he were to bow out and find some other find some way out of fighting for this war. And so that his, his community's perception of him weighs very heavily, weighs as much, it seems, as anything that he actually carried when he was in the war and involved in the actual thing. So he drives north. He, he contemplates going into Canada and finds a place called the Tip Top Lodge. He's still in Minnesota and he just sort of gets himself a room at this lodge. It's, it's off season, off peak hours. And it's just, he's basically the one there and the man who owns it. And, uh, who's, I love that character. His name's El, Elroy Birdall. Um, I really like this character because this is a, a, a sage old man who runs this place, who really knows, it seems what Tim O'Brien is dealing with and what he the emotional turmoil he is going through. Um, Elroy uh, Birdall doesn't make any judgments on him uh, and has a lot of sympathy for him, uh, but wants him to make his own decision here. Uh, and without without guidance, without prodding, without anything, uh, it seems that he just provides the circumstance for Tim O'Brien to make the decision that he does make. He spends days there. He works for Elroy Birdall. Uh, they work together. They take their meals together um, while he's contemplating, you know, this idea that, you know, Canada is, is just right over there. I can go over there at any time. Um, they work out, Birdall and he work out the money situation. Okay, how much do you owe me for staying here? But you've been working for me as well. So it ends up that um, Birdall uh, gives him $200. Basically, you've worked for me and put in more than I would have charged you off peak hours or off peak rates um, for my uh, lodge here. Um, but Tim O'Brien doesn't think he actually deserves it and should take it, so he leaves it behind 
but Birdall, Birdall tracks him down, not tracks him down, but uh, uh, Tim O'Brien finds that later on Birdall is insisting, no, you need this money, puts it in an envelope, tacks it to the door of his room with a note that says emergency fund. Emergency fund. It follows up with the comment, the man knew. That's that sage uh, insightfulness that Elroy Birdall seems to have. And he, he really puts that on display when Elroy Birdall takes him out on his boat and they go out into the waters and he realizes, Tim O'Brien realizes at some point, he's taken me beyond, you know, outside of the United States. Somewhere in the waters we have crossed over into what would be Canada. And Elroy Birdall just starts fishing, says nothing, but fishes. And Tim O'Brien sits on that boat and looks across the water and says, I could just jump in this water, wade myself on over to Canada, get into the wilds of Canada, make a way for myself and never have to fight in this war. And you know, Elroy Birdall just allows him to be alone with his thoughts to determine what is the right thing for me to do here. And Tim O'Brien can't do it. He cannot go into Canada. And the interesting thing, the reason he says this, he says, he decides that he's going to go on to the war. He says, I would go to the war. I would kill and maybe die because I was embarrassed not to. And this right here goes back to something from the very first chapter. The very first chapter, if you recall, the narrator says they carried the soldier's greatest fear, which was the fear of blushing. It was a greater fear that Tim O'Brien had, or that he's expressing here that he has, of the embarrassment of what would my community say if they knew I did this. And I can't bear that humiliation. I can't bear that embarrassment. So instead, I'm going to go to war. And that, being a soldier in a war that he articulates that he somewhat dis disagrees with, is less of a burden than the embarrassment that he would feel if he did not do it. He ends this chapter saying, I was a coward. I went to the war. Now, most of us, when we believe or what we believe about soldiers and about war, people who are brave, people who go and who, people who fight. He says the opposite. He says, I was a coward. I went to the war. He sees his stepping in and doing these, uh, what some would say, heroic deeds as being an actually confirmation of his cowardice. And what we see throughout this, and what we'll talk about here in a few chapters to come, is really, yes, the way we perceive and the way that we believe um, soldiers to be is not at all the way Tim O'Brien describes soldiers to be or their circumstance in war. Um, things aren't as clear cut as we would expect them to be. All right. So keep those things in mind as you continue to read. Uh, this, is, this book is fascinating. So continue on. Happy reading.